How are you all doing? Tired? Yeah, sleepy after a good meal? Um, okay, let, let me get a minute to get set up so I can keep track. So again, I thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. This I've come several years, but then for several years my schedule uh, didn't allow me to come, and so I'm always happy to be here. Before I get into my slide presentation, I want to make some things clear. I want to make it clear why I focus on uh, African Americans. Uh, oftentimes I have to do this because people think I'm trying to build a hierarchy of pain. I'm not. I'm in no way saying that uh, black people's pain is worse than anybody else's pain. I, what I believe, I've been doing, working in this area for over 40 years. Uh, first, about the first half of my career was as a public health nurse, as a nurse practitioner in Seattle, Oregon, and Alaska. And this last half of my career has been as a lawyer, law professor, in doing health disparities research, systems research issues. And what I, and this goes back to the discussion this morning. My, I have a beef with how we talk about racial health disparities. I have a beef with how we talk about health disparities. Because we talk about it as if it's all equal. I mean, I think that it's impossible when we talk about even social determinants of health or social gradients of health, we're still not getting down to the nitty gritty of that there are certain factors within the American society, such as race, that even in the social gradients of health makes the difference within the gradient. And that, that gets covered by this idea of class. And I'll get back to this. And so when, if history makes a difference in terms of health disparities, then how can I talk about the history of someone else that I don't even really fully understand? I teach race and racism in American law. And one of the things that I've learned from that after 23 years is that people know very little of their own racial history and nothing of no one else's. They can't talk about, re I mean, whatever they know about Native American, it is like a drop in the sea, in the ocean. Whatever they think they know about uh, Mexican Americans, whatever they think they know about Japanese Americans, and the history that got them here, <laughs> it's a drop. And so, and whatever they think they know about themselves. After years of study, I'm always learning something new. And so it seemed to me that it would be disrespectful to talk, to do research on groups that I didn't fully understand their history and could not fully articulate that history. And so I focused on African Americans. And in addition, self-interest. I've got two black boys and two black grandkids, so hey, what's happening with African Americans is my passion, okay? But I am no way, in no kind of way, trying to say that, that this is what is happening is different, or is the pain is different. So I'm supposed to match this? Yes. Um, what I want to do today is several different things. I want to talk, I want to establish, I have a line of thought that's going to take us to the end. Okay? And so I'm going to give it to you all in a good thesis statement right at the beginning. Black people are dying from being black in America. That this colorblind racism uh, society is making it worse. That health disparities between white and black people is not due to diet, exercise, or any of the things, and not even to most of the social determinants of health. It is due to racism. It is due to the stress of racism. So that poor whites and poor blacks essentially live in the same social determinants of health kind of 
black economy, but what black people experience that white, poor whites don't experience is a racialized society that causes the stress that, the, uh, that whites don't experience. That the Affordable Care Act won't address, it, it, uh, I give it a C minus on access issues, and I give it a D minus on quality issues. And that in terms of health, in terms of what needs to happen legally, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I am a complete product is antiquated for dealing with 21st century discrimination and nothing short of a new anti-discrimination law is going to make a difference. No modifications, no changes, no tinkering, no increase enforcement. The law is incapable of addressing 21st century discrimination. And so I will end with identifying what goes in the law. I'm not going to talk about ethics. <laughs> Try the arrow. The arrow. Yeah. This arrow. Okay. Okay. So I already started this, and I'm going to go rather quickly because, I, as you can see, I'm, I have a lot that I want to say in a little bit of time. So uh, I can I, I don't get excited, and, and you know maybe this is compassion weariness. But I can't get excited at 3,000 deaths. I'm sorry, 9-11. When you get to 80,000, 100,000 a year, then I'll get, I, I'll, I, it, it, it will strike me as a problem. But right now, we have 80,000 to 100,000 excess deaths, preventable deaths among African Americans. That's a jumbo jet a day would have to crash in order to have that level of excess deaths. I, earlier today, someone talked about uh, life expectancy as a measure of quality life. I think it's the World Health Organization. And the interesting thing is the CIA says the same thing, and I think that's wonderful because that means that when we look at the quality of life, we can tell what the quality of life of African Americans is in this country compared to the, not only the quality of life to white Americans, but what we see is that black American, uh, uh, black American males, the quality of life, if life expectancy, if you accept the CIA's premise that life expectancy is a measure of the quality of life, then you look at the black people in this room and they don't have the same quality of life as white people. That's what this chart says if you believe the premise of the, of the uh, CIA. Similar for the uh, black American, I mean black American female. Now, there's a whole other issue about in a country as rich as ours, our quality of life is pretty poor given the amount of money, but that's not my discussion. <laughs> Maternal death, look at this. Look at this. How, uh, how can we even stand the idea that black Americans had almost four times the maternal deaths as white Americans. That is, a white woman given birth is uh, that a black woman given birth is four almost, not quite, almost four times as likely to die as the white woman given birth. And this isn't about class. This is not about class. Let me speed up a little bit. Okay, just the same thing. So these slides, you can look at these slides on my detail. They're on the website. So I want to put this in, the, in perspective. And this is sort of the whole history thing for me. The whole idea that you have, when you look at the history of African Americans, we have a slave health deficit that comes from people did not come to this country well. There's some groups who immigrated to this country fairly healthy. Don't look 
complicated. I, I know that we as African Americans like to say that those of, our, those of our ancestors who made it here had strong genes. I'm like, it was just that the ship landed for we could die. <laughs> that if it had gone on another day or two, we'd be dead too. <laughs> and that, so we came to this country seriously unhealthy. We went through a whole period where our health was with slavery, and not to talk about the whole impact of stress, you know, where that's a whole other issue, you know, how how that chronic, prolonged, high stress, what did it do to our genes, what did it do to our biological makeup, and how has that been passed down through generations? And then you have the legal apartheid, which I refuse to call Jim Crow, because people don't know what the hell Jim Crow means, but legal apartheid, you know what that means because you know what had happened in South Africa. And then racism. I, I am a child of legal apartheid. I grew up in the legal apartheid. Legal apartheid had not ended when I graduated from high school. Okay? So when you think about the impact of these things on African Americans, don't think that that was my great grandfather. That was me. And consequently, that was my son. And so, so what that built was a historical deprivation and oppression that is also current. And so we have a whole society, a whole society, <laughs> the whole concept of whiteness is a legal concept started in the United States, exported to the rest of the world to establish, we got all these immigrants coming, we need to get them to bond together, and the whole idea was Let's establish whiteness as a concept. If you study the idea of whiteness, it is a concept born in the, the borders of this country and exported to the rest of the world. And so what you have, what we have is social and racial inequalities that are embedded in every area of American life. And those inequalities affect the communities, but then going back to the lecture, we then want to deal with individuals and not with the communities. And so then people say, well, why don't people eat right? Well, hey, I, I live in, a, in an urban community that has two grocery stores inside of a border for 100,000 people. Okay. And I have to drive an hour to get to a grocery store that doesn't soak its meat in a 14% salt solution. So, hey, you got to have a car, you have to have some money, okay? And so you have this help. So when we talk about race within the African American context, this is the whole issue that is impacting the health of African Americans. So, uh, I'm going to quickly distinguish race from class, just so, so that we're on the same uh, agenda. Oftentimes, people, yes, race is a social construction that Europe doesn't recognize. They like to say there's only one human race. I was at the 2001 World Conference Against Racism, and I can't tell you how many times someone said to me there's only one race. I was like, that's a Stupid saying. That is not as stupid. If you're talking about biology, yes. But race is a social construction. And that's like saying there's only one world because there's only one, you know, we have one world and so the United States doesn't exist because we only have one world. Well, you're right. On a, on a, a level of geography, there's only one world. But hey, countries are geopolitical constructions that have consequences. And race is a social construction that has consequences. And if you are saying that race is not a factor, then the only way you can know that is to compare civil
similarly situated people of different races. Otherwise, you're doing a class analysis. And even within, so, so, so we need to be sure that we don't fall into this because there are more blacks who are poor, poverty is the explanation. Poverty only becomes the explanation if poor blacks are doing no worse than poor whites. Poverty only becomes the explanation if middle class blacks are doing no worse than middle class whites. Poverty cannot be the explanation as race for a race thing in that situation. So, um, it's, it's jammed or something. And like you, I use my slides to know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> That's it. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to move on quickly because I'm taking a little bit more time here. Uh, it's just to show that race, not class. And the, the important thing when you go back to this slide, the important thing to look at is that if you use education as a proxy for class, which isn't entirely the same, but what you see is that whites with less than 12 years of education have fewer low birth weight babies than blacks with college, who are college graduates. Okay, so, so race matters in this country. And we can't allow the health disparities discussion to uh, pave over it. So I was, I, what I want to do is talk about a little bit because I want to get into a discussion of the Affordable Care Act. But part of what I need to talk about is uh, this new era of colorblind racism. Pretty much people who say that, uh, <laughs> I call it colorblind racism because it's based on the idea that uh, the whole issue of what's going on in our society is not overt, not even covert, and that uh, we avoid references to racial references. And it's, it's now become uh, popular to label anyone who talks about racial difference as racist. I, 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 get, I get emails like that all the time. Because we live in an era in which we want to believe because that uh, color doesn't make a difference. Now, and from a, I, I wanted to make the point that there is both conservative and liberal colorblind. Yes. That this is not a colorblindness is not about the right; it's about the left. The only thing I like about liberals is that they are. Well, I don't know that I like anything about them. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Clarence Thomas becomes an example of a conservative uh, person who believes, who has a colorblind approach. And he, and, and from a legal point of view, his uh, his uh, analysis is that race is irrelevant to a legal analysis. It has nothing to do with uh, a constitutional uh, equal protection, except in a very, very, very limited way state-sponsored conscious discrimination, conscious, intentional discrimination. Uh, and that ultimately, all other kinds of discrimination do nothing about it. And, and what we ought to do is we just, black people, you know, take those invisible shoes things and pull ourselves up. We should learn to be more like black people and, and behave accordingly, yeah, you know, be good parents and do all the things that we should do and we'd be okay. Obama is the example of a liberal colorblind person. Okay, uh, liberals say, oh, race matters, but not much. Not, and I'm not talking about liberal politics, not necessarily. I'm talking about a more liberal approach to colorblind. And, that, and they're willing to do something, but only on the limited condition. And they view discussions of race 
distasteful because they think it's divisive. So if at all possible, let's avoid a discussion on uh, any kind of frontal attack on racism, any kind of frontal uh, discussion of the problem. But they share one thing in common with the conservative colorblind person. If you black people would just get your act together <laughs> and adopt more white values, you know, stop killing each other, stop doing this, stop doing X, then you, you be, we'd be better off. <coughs> Another way to look at this, so that we can get into this, is to, to make sure that we distinguish the difference between stereotypes, bias, prejudice, and discrimination. And so, and in fact, what you can have is, most people think they have no stereotypes, biases, and prejudices and will tell you that easily. And that's mainly because they reject conscious, they consciously reject certain kinds of stereotypes. But when you see them in action, those, they have implicit stereotypes and biases. And they're willing to t tolerate discrimination so long as it's not done for the reason. So, if, so organizations are willing to have loan out less money to black people as long as they can give explanations for that that are not based on race. They know that the discrimination is occurring, but they think because it's not intentional. And this is important because this is where the law needs to change. The law fosters this. The law fosters this by saying that the only kind of discrimination that matters in our society is intentional discrimination. Okay, and I'll get back to this in a second. So, I use this, uh, a rising tide, uh, uh, President Obama's favorite term, at least in one of his campaigns, was a rising tide raises all boats. <laughs> I laughed and thought, uh, well, first of all, it may raise all votes if, in fact, you have a vote. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't, it, it drowns, it, uh, it sinks the people who are on rafts and drowns the people who are treading water. So I think we have to be careful and not get sucked into those kinds of quick sayings that makes it seem right, but really is just a cold line way to say, I'm not going to do nothing about fixing the wrath and giving you a boat because, hey, what I'm going to do is raise everybody. Uh, <coughs> so I, I mentioned this, and you can look at the slide. I don't want to go over it. It's just that chronic, we all know what chronic stress of any type will do to the body. All of you in here know that. Racism is a source of chronic stress. Racialized behavior, not just racism. You know, going into a store, and this just, it happens to me frequently. So you have to, you go in and there is behavior that seems racialized. And so then you get into this internal discussion. Do I confront it? Do I say something? Do I just ignore it? But we know, what do you, what happens to your body when you ignore things? It keeps turning at you. It's not like you're really going to ignore it. It's just that it's going to go somewhere else in your body and drive up your blood pressure and make your sugar go all wrong. And so what we have, I put my family up here because I am the first. My sons don't eat no pork, pork feet. I do. They don't eat chitlins. I do. <laughs> they don't eat none of the fatty stuff. And yet, my sons have health issues that are associated with a class that is different. My sons are upper middle class, was raised upper middle class, and when I cooked the stuff I liked, they wouldn't eat it. <laughs> so I don't want people, people have to start asking, why is the health disparities continuing to exist? among the population of people who have not done all of the things that we uh, 
have talked about in the past related to it eating and that sort of thing. And what I'm saying is that it has been passed down generationally. That be, coming in as slaves affected my family's health, going through Jim Crow affected my family's health, and as all you know, and it's a public health premise, the health of the mother affects the health of the child. Well, if that's true, then the health of my grandmother affected me, the health of my great-grandmother affected me, and this is why it's important to get the history of the people that you are looking at. What does it feel like, I wonder, I think about? I think about, I wonder. What does it feel like to have all this discussion about go back to Mexico when, as a Mexican-American who understands that we illegally, illegally stole a fifth of their country and that the fifth that we stole is what made us rich? So every time we say go back to Mexico, they may be saying, I, you know, I would if you hadn't stolen my country. <laughs> Uh, again, another example of the disparities, uh, infant mortality. I'm going to go back, low birth weight. Uh, I, I like this slide because the low birth weight among uh, African Americans <laughs> is worse than African countries. So when Newt Grindry says you, you're better off here than you are in Africa, I say, oh, you really haven't seen things, really, have you? Uh, let me see. So, uh, good. So I want to now. So so basically, I want to we at least as quick as well as I can. There is a health disparity that is based on history, that is not uh, that is based on embedded social inequalities, and that is seriously not related to class. So what about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act? The interesting thing about so I have it. Economic barriers, and in fact, I, sometimes I, you know, you, as a teacher, I'm supposed to grade. So I'm like, yeah, it may provide extensive econo uh, economic access, uh, although it leaves out a significant number, like uh, undocumented immigrants won't have access. So we still have a significant population that will not have access to care. But you know, this what's come from living a long time. I remember when Medicaid came in and how everybody, oh, you know, Medicaid is going to provide access. Providers wouldn't take it. And it wasn't because it didn't pay too little. They become sophisticated and said now and say, well, it's because of the payment rate. No, they didn't want those those people in their waiting room. And they wouldn't take it. And the reason I worked at a community health clinic in the 70s is because I, the community was surrounded by providers who would not take it. Now, the interesting thing with the Affordable Care Act is they had the opportunity to make that illegal. To say, if you take any patient, you cannot refuse a patient on the source of their insurance. Does the bill do that? So you have to ask yourself, if you really want to provide access to people of color, why wouldn't you eliminate that source of discrimination, that, that implicit discrimination by discriminating on the base of the source of your insurance? Um, it needs to move for me. I just finished teaching uh, race, health care, and the law, and uh, it's not moving. Shame. Thank you. Uh, one of the barriers. So barriers to hospitals and providers is the other barrier. And again, the, the law does something, but one of the things it does is it does um, it doesn't fund enough, and the funding's not long enough. If we're going to deal with, and there is not one of the problems is it doesn't have 
a good way of tracking the impact. This is the colorblind approach that I'm saying. You can't just use the word health disparity without having a way to tra in, uh, track the impact of your own funding. What, what is the impact of your funding on uh, eliminating health disparities? It is expanding uh, community health centers, but it doesn't really, as far as I can tell, address the lack of, ha lack of hospital facilities. There's no hill burden part of the act to build hospitals in urban areas in rural communities. And without hospitals, uh, you know, you have a community health center, but you need hospitals as well. Uh, with providers, it does do something to improve the health care workforce. It establishes nurse managed uh, health centers. It does a demonstration project, which I always love. Demonstration project is just sort of like, okay, here's some money for three years. Uh, and it does nothing to say about uh, continuous funding. But all of this is done in a colorblind approach. Nothing in the bill really attracts requires the tracking of the impact of the bill's own provisions for elimination of racial health disparities. Uh, and that's the, it does data collection. Now, one of the things that I've been thinking about related to data collection, and, and it really actually may be the provision that is the best in the bill because it really calls for breaking down data on in a lot of different parts, but one of the parts that doesn't break down, and I'm not quite sure how to do it, is to talk about indigenous blacks. I think that we, that there are African Americans who have their history out of slavery, and there are African Americans who don't. And that in order to be able to know what's going on with those two different groups, if there's anything different, we need a way to track that. And, uh, and, and right now, we're still dealing with the, you are black if you have one drop, or if you call yourself black, or if you want to be black, or if the person <laughs> sitting across from you think you're black. And <laughs> um, as far as the person who has her history out of slavery, I want to be able to say, good or bad, what is happening to our population, you know, as opposed to other blacks who don't have that history. Out of American slavery in particular, because I know there's sort of, you know, America wasn't the only one slave, uh, slave for it, but American slavery was particularly vicious. Another lecture. <laughs> um, Discrimination and treatment, and this skill comes in the, <laughs> I went round and round over the totally inadequate, hateful provision that they call an anti-discrimination law in, the, uh, in uh, section 1557. It doesn't, uh, and the problem with it is number one, it ties itself, it ties the enforcement component into Title VI, and Title VI is problematic. Title VI first requires intentional, only intentional. Title VI has, uh, there's a case of Alexander versus Sandoval, or Andrew, I always mix up those names. Uh, senior moment. Uh, there's a case. Uh, over 10 years ago, where the Supreme Court of the United States said that you, if you get discriminated against because of disparate impact, that not intentional, but the numbers show that you're being discriminated against, you can't sue. You can't sue. How many of you know that? You cannot bring a suit. What can you do? You can say, Department of Justice. Will you file a suit for me? And depending on the priorities of the Department of Justice, depending on the priorities of the administration, depending on the funding of the administration, they may say yes or no. In the meantime, I dare say 90% of the discrimination that occurs in healthcare in this country is not intentional. It's disparate impact. So that essentially means 
that there is no way in the court. Not just in health care, in every other area of American life. People tell me all the time, we have discrimination law. We have intentional anti-discrimination law. Oh, it, it, it infuriates me, if you can't tell. Oh, and I keep, I don't know. So, what do we need? Oh, good, I'm right on time. Is it working now? Yes, no, it's not. Uh, thank you. So, thank you. Oh, I, I put this in. This is the non-secular that I just had to throw in because I know that people are going to be talking about other countries. And here's the thing. We are blessed to live in a country that recognizes race and has been collecting race-based data for a long time because many of the countries, other countries, have not recognized race as a separate independent classification and have not been collecting data. And one of the big problems that my peer African descent people say they have in the countries they live in is, is that whenever they try to talk about the discrimination that they ex experience, they don't have the data to back it up in the same way that we have the data to back it up. So uh, my point is that I do not believe that any of these sim systems eliminate inequalities based on race because they don't eliminate uh, they don't eliminate the underlying racial bias problem that that goes on. I think what these systems do is provide better access, uh, and to some extent. Uh, depending on how they track it, they might improve quality. But based on what I am hearing from my peers, uh, it hasn't been dealt with. So, discrimination, I want to talk about law. I'm going to talk about discrimination law, but I want to talk about it as both the pathway and the shaper of health disparities. Uh, Maybe is I'm a lawyer, but I used to be a nurse. And so pretty much I have come to the conclusion that the law provides the mechanism to uh, make changes in our society. Uh, and that without a favorable laws, uh, you can get it, but it's harder. And that what we have, because one of our Values is we see we like to we are the people that lives by the rule of law, and I'm always amazed by that because when I get at a stoplight that I can see for two miles either way and there's no traffic, I'm always amazed that people sit at the light. <laughs> I'm like, well, why are you sitting here? There's no traffic and you can see for two miles, so because we believe in obeying the law. And that most people <coughs> obey the laws that they don't believe in. And, and so if we want to change how health disparities is dealt with in the society, then we need to change the laws that address it. And I think to some extent, the Affordable Care Act, by using the term health disparities throughout, takes us on the road to have people acknowledge that, but by not dealing with racial health disparities and by requiring tracking, it makes us harder. If they had just required tracking in the law for everything, then we would have been a long ways towards being able to make a difference. So what would I see in an anti-discrimination law? Um, I don't mean, I didn't mean to. Uh, okay, I want to just talk about this. I've talked towards and I've talked um, toward law is when you sue someone for injuring you. Criminal law is when you have injured someone against the state and the state calls it a crime. Criminal and tort law is based on the idea that the injured party should have a way into court. The whole idea is to give the injured party as many ways into court as possible. 
And so what you have is, yes, intentional things are covered, but so is reckless. That is, no, you didn't intend it, but you knew there was a really high risk that your behavior was going to cause this injury. You're responsible. No, you didn't know there was a risk. You didn't know there was a risk. You didn't intend it. You didn't know that it was a risk. <laughs> Never mind. You should have known. You should have known it was a risk, and you should have acted reasonably. And it was unreasonable for you to leave that water on the floor. That's negligence. And then strict liability says, <laughs> not only didn't you didn't intend it, and you didn't act recklessly, and you weren't negligent, we're just going to hold you responsible because you did the act. <laughs> okay? Discrimi Anti-discrimination law in the United States only outlaws intentional. So now, what's the, we've got three areas of the law that is talking about injury to the person. Two of those say we want as many people to get into the court as possible, and one of them say we want as few as people to get in the law into the court as possible. So, what I see we need in the 21st century anti discrimination law first of all, first and foremost, we need to recognize multiple forms of discrimination. And I would say, I can easily individualize intentional reckless and negligent. I have a harder time coming up with something that I would call strict liability. But I'm of the opinion that the law should be written to let the courts settle it. That we shouldn't try to restrict it. But the problem is, if, you, if the law doesn't say that all forms of discrimination are covered, the courts, because of history, is going to limit it to intentional. I think we need to authorize the use of medical testers. We need people to go in with medical records and see what they do. What test do they order? Part of the problem with 21st discrimination is no one says to me, I'm not ordering a test for you because you're black. What they do is they order a test, and how am I supposed to know whether those tests are appropriate or not? I'm just a patient, a sick one at that. And so I put my trust in the doctor, and in, we need medical testers. We need someone to go in and test what's happening. We need an individual and organizational right of action. What does that mean? Well, within the courts, you have to have something that's called standing. That means you have to actually have been the person who's injured. And uh, that's why we have to have test authorized medical testers, because medical testers can't sue unless the court allows them, because they never was really injured. If you go someplace never really intending to, to get care, you weren't injured when you didn't get it. And so you need, uh, you need to authorize it. Part of the problem with anti-discrimination law is by focusing on individual right of action, we then allow civil rights organizations are caught up into the paradigm of trying to hunt down that, down that individual who has been injured with the right facts when they have all the data they need to make a suit. They just need an individual. I say, allow an organizational right of action. Allow the NAACP to bring the lawsuit for anti-discrimination based solely on the statistics and not on any particular individual being injured. Now, someone's going to say, oh, I don't know if that's right, and all I do is I point to Greenpeace, and I say Greenpeace has an organizational right of action to bring lawsuits on behalf of trees. <laughs> if we can allow uh, environmental organizations to bring uh, uh, or, uh, lawsuits on behalf of what's happening to the community, why can't we allow civil rights organizations to bring lawsuits on, uh, on behalf of the community? Uh, I, to some extent, the, 
This slide's a little old, but the, uh, we make all providers and institutions responsible. And, and, and to, uh, the, the, uh, in fact, the Affordable Care Act does do that. The problem is the, the section 1157 is the poor uh, section. And it was a political compromise done to try to get gender uh, covered and sexual orientation covered. They were hoping not to spell out in more detail in the law on the idea that the court would interpret the statute broadly and allow for more gender coverage and more uh, coverage for African American. I mean, more coverage for uh, people uh, set with different sexual orientations. Uh, when I brought this to the attention of people, and that I told them that I thought what would happen is, is that the same bad law from Title VI would be put on uh, race-based suits, they said to me, what do you care? You don't have nothing now. So it was clear that Todd, this Section 1157 was not done with the interest of getting, uh, dealing with racial discrimination. And it won't. Uh, we need to establish equality health care councils uh, for, in states. We need places where people can go and, and, and get information and talk. Uh, deep data collection. Uh, the Affordable Care Act does a good job. I would make it even deeper. Um, and I had rep uh, equality report courts, racial equality report courts, and I would take it down to as low as levels as possible. Providers, yes. Yes, providers. As long as you have enough people in your patient population that no particular <coughs> patient can be identified, then yes, you have to report on how you are doing. Will that have a chilling effect? Well, who, why, you know, it may. But right now, we're in the place where we have all this discrimination going on. So I think that the report court will, uh, will have, uh, play, have a good role. Uh, we, our part of the problem with Title VI is we never had the appropriate fine structure. Sort of like, if you violate Title VI, we will take away your license to be to be a hospital, I'm like, oh, really? So that's how come you're never going to find a Title VI violation, because nobody wants to close down a hospital, especially if it's the only hospital in the community. What you need is, if you violate Title VI or this new law, you will be charged $50,000 a day as long as the violation occur. They will change really quick, and people could enforce that because it's not about closing the hospital down. Paying prevailing plaintiff's attorney fees. I'm a lawyer. I teach lawyers, and I can tell you that you want people to be going with small claims. You want people to sue on small claims. One of the biggest problems with medical malpractice right now is, is that most of the injuries to medical malpractices are not ever seen the light of day because the injuries are too small for what it costs to litigate. But if you had prevailing plaintiff's attorney fees, then an attorney doesn't have to worry about, is this going to be enough to pay for what I have to put into the case? And you have to allow punitive damages. You have to, have to fight anything that goes about the punitive damage. I know people think, I don't know why someone who spills coffee on them gets several million dollars. Well, because Matt Down injured 700 people with scalding hot coffee and refused to turn down the temperature on their coffee, refused to turn, put up a notice, and that if all you had given that woman was $20,000 that was her medical injury, they would have kept on injuring people. Punitive damages is the way we hurt organizations into changing their behavior. That's the only way. They can calculate down to the penny how many lawsuits will occur, what the average award will be, and whether or not it is financially worth it to continue in the base and continue with the behavior. They cannot calculate punitive
damages. Now, I kind of agree that not all the punitive damages need to go to the plaintiff who brought the suit, largely because I think that uh, it just happened to be the first in line. So I would say some of the money should go into a fund to fund <coughs> health care services that dedicated to the fund, uh, uh, health care services and enforcement. Um, but you can't do away with punitive damages. You can't give it all to a fund because states who have tried that, that is allow punitive damages but give it all to a fund, states who have tried that have found that attorneys lose interest in going after punitive damages. So you've got to keep, you've got to dangle the carrot in front of the attorney's eyes and say, you know, there you could get a lot of money out of this for punitive damages. Uh, okay, somehow. I just wanted to end, I'm not going to go through this line by line. I'm not going to go through this line by line largely because uh, it's in your packet. But what I want to say to you is that what this does is sort of track our, the history of African American and health care disparities. So remember, the health disparities, we came to this country unhealthy. I think the nearest population group might be the Irish, who also came here unhealthy. Uh, but they've been absorbed through uh, 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 assimilation, so it may be harder to track that. The Appalachians uh, is a mixed group. Appalachian whites is a mixed group. Uh, other groups that have come here have not come in the same unhealthy state, but they have had other issues that, uh, that affected their health. And of course, there was just complete genocide against uh, Native Americans. Uh, so what we see is very lit, the health disparities continue to today, that the work on the health disparities only has been in the last 37 years, okay? That's, that's not only my lifetime, that's like the last half of my career or something. So you're really not talking about a long time of work. So I'm going to end with this. You know, W.E. Du Bois talked about the problem of the 20th century was the problem of the color line, and that color line was overtly and legally enforced. The problem of the 21st century is continues to be the problem of the color line. That color line is enforced through policies and practices and procedures that have the effect of discrimination. And that and in the, if we don't do something about it, you will be talking about this in 40 years to a group of people talking about these problems continue to exist. Thank you.